Well, hey there, fellow sojourners, and welcome back to another edition of Appropriate in the Culture. Sorry I missed you last week. I had an impromptu trip out of town, couldn't squeeze it into my schedule. And so many of you are, understandably, going through withdrawals after missing your weekly fix of ATC. If you have an addiction problem, you should seek help. After this episode, of course, because today we're diving back into the hot topic, hot topic. of abortion. We'll be looking at purported religious arguments in favor of abortion and analyze whether or not Christians should impose their religion on society. I'm Pastor Shane, I'll be your religious imposer today as we appropriate some culture. Although not official, the end of Roe v. Wade seems to be looming and that has sparked some rather incendiary responses, literally. In Wisconsin, a Molotov cocktail was hurled through the window of a pro-life advocacy group and the words, if abortions aren't safe, then you aren't either, was spray painted on their walls. I have to say, it's not bad penmanship. But after the attack, pro-choice advocates rallied around the Wisconsin Family Action Center, leaving message after message on their answering services, pouring out heartfelt condolences and stirring impassioned monologues on the importance of civility and decency, even in the face of disagreement. Take a listen. Hi, I'm calling because I read about the fire in your building, and I'm calling because I'm curious if it was arson, or rather the good Lord showing you an example of hell, and where you belong for being such a misogynistic bitch. Thanks for uh, basically going out there daily and making sure that women can't have control over their own bodies. And I'm so thankful that the good Lord finally took action on people like you. You're going to burn as well. You're all going to burn. You think you're following the will of Jesus. You're following the and that will actually, you're just evil little f***ing people try to control other people's lives. And next time that f***ing bolt off, I hope it f***ing doesn't f***ing miss. I hope you all burn with it. That's what you deserve. <laughs> yeah, you must be a pretty perverted group if that's all you got to do all day long is think about people's sex organs. Leave your f***ing beliefs out of the government. You got no rights to be Priding into other people's private family matters. Get the f out and keep your f***ing sh to yourself, you f idiot. We sick of you f***ing evangelical pieces of sh Go to hell. That's where you're going anyway. As a darn evangelical, I can appreciate their concern for our eternal souls, but their sales pitch could use a little refining. Blank you, a comprehensive guide, is not quite as inviting as, you know, the four spiritual laws. But this notion of religion inserting itself into the abortion issue is a common rejoinder. CNN political analyst Kirsten Powers tweeted, If you think abortion is wrong, don't get an abortion. It's not okay to impose your religious views on others. Why should a Jew or Muslim, for example, have to live according to your interpretation of the Bible? If you don't get this, please don't ever use the phrase religious freedom again. And that sentiment that anti-abortion or pro-life advocates are governed by religion is stated by the blue check marks and then echoed by the randos on Twitter like at big underscore will 942 who says, yeah, an abortion should be fully legal at any stage. I def what your religion says. Science says you are a living human when you're outside your parents' stomach and breathing. A dead giveaway that someone doesn't have a firm grasp on science is when they use the term science says. Science says, touch your head. Science says, touch your nose. Kill your baby. Wait, I didn't say science says. The other giveaway is when they suggest that babies reside in the stomach of parents, plural, and humans cease to be humans when they're on ventilators. But we'll get to the science in a moment. Let's stick with the religion. There is certainly a correlation between religious affiliation and the pro-life position, but not really in the way that people often think. And there are some Jews, Muslims, and even purported Christians that argue God is in favor of abortion. John Fogelsang puts forth this position succinctly in this tweet. Let's take the claim here one by one. 
The Bible never forbids abortion. Mm, true, the Bible does not explicitly state you shall not have an abortion, but there are references to the unborn. Psalm 139.13 is a prominent one. For you created my inmost being, you knit me together in my mother's womb. And the Bible also doesn't explicitly forbid slavery. So by that reasoning, John Fogelsang is in favor of slavery, yes? Or do we perhaps look at the principles articulated through Scripture and apply it to our laws and lives? Interesting notion. Next, the Bible says life begins with breath. Okay, so this ludicrous idea is based solely on Genesis 2-7, which says this, Then the Lord God formed man of dust from the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living being. See, he wasn't a living being until he had breath in him. It's a weird place to be super literal. Adam was formed from dust. We're formed by sperm and egg coming together. I don't want to spoil it for you. Adam was never a zygote or embryo or fetus or had any gestation period at all. Adam was never in a womb. Adam was never birthed. Come to think of it, it's almost as if Adam's creation and our creation are really, really different. And how does breathing as the demarcation of life make any sense with passages like this? Luke chapter 1. When Elizabeth heard Mary's greeting, the baby leaped in her womb, and Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit. And she cried out with a loud voice and said, Blessed are you among women, and blessed is the fruit of your womb. And how has it happened to me that the mother of my Lord would come to me? For behold, when the sound of your greeting reached my ears, the baby leaped in my womb for joy. And blessed is she who believed that there would be a fulfillment of what had been spoken to her by the Lord. So John the Baptist hasn't breathed yet, so he's not alive when he's jumping for joy. Are we sure Elizabeth is full of the Spirit when she says that? Because sounds like she's full of something else. Am I right, John Fogel saying? Next, God says fetus has less value than woman in Exodus. It doesn't. Here's the passage in question, Exodus 21. If men struggle with each other and strike a woman with child so that she gives birth prematurely, yet there is no injury, he shall surely be fined as the woman's husband may demand of him, and he shall pay as the judges decide. But if there is any further injury, then you shall appoint as a penalty life for life. Now you might be thinking, that doesn't sound like an abortion at all, and you'd be right. The issue here is that a minority of translations don't say she gives birth prematurely, it says she has a miscarriage. Now why the discrepancy? Well, translation is a bit of an art. The word used there is a combination of a Hebrew noun, yaled, and a verb, yasa, and it literally means the child comes forth. But does the child come forth alive or dead? One would be a miscarriage, the other a premature birth. Well, to answer that, you look at how the word is used in history and particularly how it's used in the Hebrew Bible. Here's some examples. Now the first came forth, red, all over like a hairy garment, and they named him Esau. And afterward, his brother came forth with his hand holding onto Esau's heel, so his name was called Jacob. This man will not be your heir, but one who shall come forth from your own body. That's coming forth, but it's not coming forth with something dead. And what's more than that is there are much more specific words in Hebrew for miscarriage. Here's examples of how they're used in the Hebrew Bible. Or like a miscarriage which is discarded, I would not be as infants that never saw light. Let them be as a snail which melts away as it goes along like the miscarriages of a woman which never see the sun. These twenty years I have been with you, your ewes and your female goats have not miscarried, nor have I eaten the rams of your flocks. If what is stated in Exodus meant miscarriage, there are better word options. Next, God mandates abortion for unfaithful wives in numbers. <sighs> So this is the jealousy trial. If the spouse has suspicions that their partner has not been faithful but there is no proof, here's what can be done. Here's that passage, Numbers chapter 5. Then the priest shall bring her near and have her stand before the Lord, and the priest shall take holy water in an earthenware vessel, and he shall take some of the dust that is on the floor of the tabernacle and put it into the water. The priest shall then have the woman stand before the Lord and let the hair of the woman's head go loose and place the grain offering of memorial in her hands, which is the grain offering of jealousy, and then the hand of the priest is to be the water of bitterness that brings a curse. 
The priest shall have her take an oath and shall say to the woman, If no man has lain with you, and if you have not gone astray into uncleanness, being under the authority of your husband, be immune to this water of bitterness that brings a curse. If you, however, have gone astray, being under the authority of your husband, and if you have defiled yourself, and a man other than your husband has had intercourse with you, then the priest shall have the woman swear with the oath of the curse, and the priest shall say to the woman, the Lord make you a curse and an oath among your people by the Lord's making your thigh waste away and your abdomen swell. And this water that brings a curse shall go into your stomach and make your abdomen swell and your thigh waste away. And the woman shall say, Amen and Amen. Okay, so first off, the curse is barrenness, not abortion. Holy water with a little dust sprinkled in is not a known abortifacient. If you drink holy water with dust in it, the most likely thing to happen to you is nothing. It's weird that I have to explain that. Really, the main purpose of this test is to protect women. It calms the enraged, unsubstantiated jealousy of husbands and protects women in that time from frivolous, baseless divorces. But it also doesn't hurt to have the fear of God in you. And if God chooses to supernaturally curse you because of your sin, well, he's free to do that. Next, God frequently demands slaughter of infants and fetuses. Frequent might be a bit of a stretch. If you take the hundreds of thousands of years of all of human history, rarely does God demand the slaughter of infants and fetuses. But it's not never like here for Samuel. Now go and strike Amalek and utterly destroy all that he has and do not spare him, but put to death both man and woman, child and infant, ox and sheep, camel and donkey. God's wrath is terrifying, we shouldn't sugarcoat that, and it can be hard to understand, but the scriptures do tell us that we are, by nature, objects of wrath. And David declares in the Psalms, Surely I was sinful at birth, sinful from the time my mother conceived me. Coincidentally, that also seems to indicate that David was a he, a being, a person in his mother's womb, and even a living entity, a person in his conception. But it also reinforces the Christian notion of a sin nature, that we are fallen and corrupt beings, and that we are all deserving, not just of death, but of hell itself. But that doesn't mean, then, that we have license to kill each other. God, at some points in history, has used people to enact his righteous judgment. But that is not our calling as Christians under the new covenant, and it certainly isn't an argument for abortion. God never said, go kill the infant and the fetuses, because they're not really human, so it's okay. No, he said, go kill men and women and children and infants and animals. Go kill everything. If it's okay to kill the unborn by that rationale, then it's okay to kill literally everything. Next, Jesus never mentions it. Jesus never mentioned rape, so rape away! Or maybe take the totality of Scripture as the Word of God. Next, J.C. did oppose the death penalty. Wrong topic. He's probably talking about the adulterous woman, which is nonsense. You can go back and look at the episodes where I address the death penalty. But for the sake of argument, let's just grant the premise. Jesus opposed the death penalty. Therefore, we should kill the unborn. That's what we call a non sequitur. But fact, reason, logic, and moral clarity is not everyone's strong suit. So I think we've demonstrated that God is not in favor of abortion. There is no positive case for abortion in Scripture. And just taking the Bible passages we looked at today, there's really a better argument against abortion. But I think there's a broader principle that is clearly and unquestionably articulated in Scripture, which is... All human beings are created in the image of God, and because of that, every human being has intrinsic value and worth. And admittedly, that is a religious notion. That all human beings have value cannot be demonstrated scientifically, it cannot be deduced by sheer logic, and plenty of people throughout history have argued to the contrary. It is a purely religious notion that all human beings have inherent value. But that is the justification against murder and infanticide and slavery and racism, and Christians have been imposing that religious notion onto societies for centuries. Uh, go read the writings of the abolitionists. Uh, go read or listen to the speeches of Martin Luther King Jr. A lot of God talk. Man, you know, stop posing your religious notion that black people are fully human. Or how about infanticide? 
We can all agree that's evil, right? No. Child sacrifice was common in the ancient world. Infanticide was quite common. And not even for pagan reasons. Not for sacrifice, but just economics and family planning. You didn't want the baby? You go dump it off outside and let it die of exposure. They even had designated places for that. That was common. Here's a letter that we have from a Roman soldier to his pregnant wife. I am still in Alexandria. I beg and plead with you to take care of our little child, and as soon as we receive wages, I will send them to you. In the meantime, if, good fortune to you, you give birth, if it is a boy, let it live. If it's a girl, expose it. And Christians, contrary to the culture, believing that human beings have intrinsic worth, would rescue those discarded babies. In 318, Constantine, who converted to Christianity, declared exposure to be a crime. And in 374 AD, it was a capital offense. Ugh, stop imposing your religion. If you don't like infanticide, don't kill your infant. Right, Kirsten Powers? No, Christians have been imposing our religious framework onto societies for centuries, and the world is less barbaric, more humane, and better for it. And by and large, the modern world has accepted the religious notion that all human life is valuable. So the only question that matters when it comes to the unborn is, what is it? Is it a living human being or not? That is the central question. Nothing else matters. Nothing else is at all relevant on the issue of abortion. And we'll look at that question in detail next week. But as usual, if you like what we're doing here, like, subscribe, rate, review, follow me on Twitter, Locals, join my author's Facebook page, and I'll see you next week for more Appropriate in the Culture.